Hey guys, thank you for uh, joining us in this session. Uh, this is uh, track uh, modeling uh, A2 and uh, modeling for design. Our first presentation is going to be from Stephen Morgan. Uh, he's with the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Uh, and he's going to be discussing SRH2D versus HECRAS, a case study on bridge modeling hydraulics. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to add them into the chat, and we will uh, be addressing them as time allows in between sessions. Thank you. To discuss some modeling approaches with y'all today, so thanks for joining. Um, I'm Matt Hornack with ESP Associates out of Raleigh, North Carolina, and we had the privilege last year to use SRH2D and HECRAS2D side by side for a North Carolina Department of Transportation project. And I'm thankful to represent Stephen Morgan and Matt Lawfer from NCDOT, as well as my colleague Greg Garrett as we discuss this project that would improve accessibility for residents in North Carolina. So since this is a recorded presentation, I'm not going to remove any information. I'm just going to move quickly through the slides to ensure that we can get through everything. Uh, so right off the bat, I think it's a good idea to address the main question. You know, why would we want to compare SRH2D and HECRAS? Uh, the big reason is FHWA is invested in the software, and so DOTs are beginning to use it at the request of FHWA. And one major reason that they want to use SRH2D is it has the ability to handle pressure flow scenarios. And so what is pressure flow? Well, the image to the left here uh, shows that when um, the water surface elevation rises up to the level of the bridge, then pressure can build up and force water through that bridge opening. And so you can see that, that area of low energy under the bridge as water gets forced under the opening. And so remember this figure, because we're gonna discuss it again at the end of the presentation. I want to say that we didn't have any practical experience with SRH2D prior to this project, and so there was some learning on the job. And can I get a show of hands? Who has experience using SRH2D? All right, who has used HECRAS2D? Okay, yeah, this is recorded, so I can't see anything, but I'm just going to assume most people have used HECRAS, um, and therefore it's interesting to, to be able to present on something like this where we get to compare these two softwares together. So here's just a sample of what SMS looks like for SRH2D model development. Um, here we're looking at mesh generation and land cover, as well as boundary conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all the different things that go into making the model. And we'll talk more about that in the future. Now, I'm going to use SRH2D and SMS interchangeably throughout the presentation. Uh, but just know that SMS is just a GUI. It's a graphic user interface um, that Aquaveo created that can actually run several different models and SRH2D is one of them. So it's no different than the interface that pops up when you open up HECRAS. Now here we're looking at HECRAS and y'all will probably recognize that we've got a geometry file open and some flow files down here, um, as well as RAS mapper. And so all HECRAS models are made up of a geometry file and a flow file, even 1D models. And so if you're looking at this and you've only done 1D, you'll probably recognize it. And that, that transition from 1D to 2D in HECRAS is pretty straightforward. Now, before we get into comparing the two models, I want to say none of this comparison is intended to promote one program or the other. They're totally separate, and one is free, which I'm a fan of, but um, another one is paid, and you get some good stuff for what you pay for. So, you know, I'm going to just present what I know and let you all decide what you want to do. Um, I want to read this list to you, but there are some things I want to highlight about SRH2D. One, as we've mentioned, it uh, contains the ability to model pressure flow. Another cool part of it is that you can actually continue to work while you're running the model. And some of that is because of the way SMS works, but you can, you can start running your SRH2D calculations and then go back in SMS and start making modifications if you, if you need to. And that's a really cool component. Now, terrain is typically, you know, the first part of uh, hydraulic analysis, and SMS is pretty powerful in the way that it can process terrains. There's a lot of options. It lets you bring in a lot of different data together, so you're not limited to just a grid, but you can also bring in LIDAR points and uh, survey data, mesh it all together. And it's really helpful if you don't have GIS capabilities because it does a lot of 
um, that conversion for you and gives you the flexibility to work with what you got. Um, coverages in SMS are kind of the building blocks of the model. Uh, I like to think of it as the way HMS has different components that you bring into a simulation run. So you might create a basin, you've got your precipitation data, then you define your time constraints. And then the simulation run wants you to point to all of those different things before it does the analysis. Well, um, SRH2D works the same way within SMS. Um, you, you pull in your end values into one, your terrain and other boundary conditions, and then you point it to all of that and it runs the model. So a very similar process. And looking at in values here, you can see that a materials coverage can be used to represent the in values uh, within your project. And one cool part of SRH2D is you can, you can do depth varied in values, which is very nice. Uh, also, when you're developing your 2D mesh, um, there are several different approaches towards doing that um, within SMS. And so I put these in the wrong order here. The, you, you would think they'd go left to right, but it's actually right to left. So looking on the right side at the patch type of mesh generation, this would be used for um, generating a, a mesh over a roadway or generating it within a channel within the banks. Uh, the paving, which is in the middle, is what you would generally use over your whole area, but also it kind of represents odd features. So this is an intersection of a road. So you might patch the mesh all the way up to this intersection, but then because it's not really a uniform shape, it, um, you use a paving method there. And then on the left side, you see that you can also use none so you don't need to use the mesh somewhere and you can create holes within your mesh that allows you to model obstructions like piers or buildings or something else, which is very helpful. And so similar to any other model, you're going to need water coming into the model and then you need water coming out of the model. And so we set up boundary conditions uh, within a coverage to do that. And there's also options for additional boundary conditions as well. So one example might be a levy. And if you want to model a levy, then you're going to want to set up a weir boundary condition within your model. Um, there's also pressure flow boundaries, which, can, which would be included in that boundary condition file. And these are placed at the upstream and downstream face of a bridge to model that pressure flow through the structure. Now, SRH2D um, and SMS all, also models culverts the same way, um, but it, it's going to take that culvert and it's going to go out to HY8 to do the calculation. So you need to know that at every time step, going out to HY8 to run that calculation, which can slow down your processing time. So I just want to mention that, that if you're doing a larger model that takes a long time to run, that can add some time to your run. And then once you've got all your coverages set, you can set up your simulation and run the model. And so it's very simple also to then set up additional simulations and run multiple scenarios, kind of like a sensitivity analysis. You can vary the different types of input coverages that you want to refer to and then all the different simulations you run can reference different inputs and, and vary the types of data that you're dealing with and, and look at what the results are. So when you're actually running the model, it can be a little bit slower. When we were using the model, it's a, it only uses a single core. And I think they're supposed to come out with a multi-core version, but it can be slow compared to HECRAS. Now generally with SRHUD, you're gonna run a smaller model. Um, but if you are running a model with the same number of cells, we found that HECRAS probably runs it in about half the time. Um, now, when you are running it, you have the option to look at this monitor line plot. And since we are running a steady flow through the whole reach, uh, we are waiting on all these different lines to come up and converge to the flow that's being applied through the model. And that lets us know that we've got um, the, the same steady discharge being applied throughout the model and our results should be stable. Uh, similarly, you can track your errors through this residual plot. You just need to re reference the scale because while you might see spikes that look like an error, you can see that it's a, it's a very small difference um, in calculation here in this plot, but you might have a, a bigger difference in your model if you're running it. Now, once you run the model, you want to look at mapping. Um, and you don't really want to take the SRH2D boundary and smooth it for mapping. You could do that, but I would recommend exporting the calculation nodes and performing your own mapping. And so small cells can definitely get you better mapping, but they also can increase your runtime because you've got more cells and more computations. Um, so SRHUD is a little bit more of a manual effort than pulling the mapping from RASMapper, but we're gonna talk more about why that automated mapping might not be the best, so stick around. Now looking at HECRAS, I'm not gonna read all these to you, but I do wanna highlight the important ones for you. And of course it's free, 
but another great thing that HECRAS offers is a variable time step, which can help control your model stability, but it also can increase your runtime because whenever your model is, stabil is stable, it's going to increase that time step and see if it's able to continue running at a faster rate. Now, with the latest version of HECRAS, there are tools for working with the mesh in both the geometry editor and in RAS Mapper, um, but some options provided in SRHGD are missing from HECRAS, which is why it's not a free software. SRHGD isn't free. Uh, SRHGD gives you the chance to have holes in the, in the mesh, which is very helpful, and you can't do that in HECRAS. Um, so we end up uh, taking different approaches to model things like piers and bridges, and we'll talk about those. Now for terrain and HECRAS, you aren't able to bring in just point data. You need to, you're going to stack up DEMs and different grids to build that terrain. And you also don't have the op option of editing node specific elevations. Um, and so you kind of are stuck with whatever you get once you bring in those DEMs. So if you want to make any modifications, you're going to need to do that outside of RAS before you pull it in. Uh, also, Unlike um, SRH2D, RAS is actually simple and efficient with culverts. Uh, inputs for modeling a culvert in 2D RAS is very similar to a 1D model. Um, and because you're using a 2D model, it allows you to have overland flow over the top of that culvert once it's reached its capacity, which is nice. Now, you can bring in land cover data using shape files or using an NLCD raster grid um, in HECRAS, so either or. And then it also has the option of of identifying an override region if there are any discrepancies that need to be corrected. So if you review aerial imagery and you see something that doesn't quite line up with the data set you had, then you can make an override region and fix the end value in that area. Now peer modeling. While HECRAS 2D is not able to model pressure flow scenarios, one way that you can reflect bridges that sit above the flooding elevations is you can use an end value override polygon to reflect pier obstructions. So mesh alignment is needed in those areas so that the cells reflect those manning in value areas. Um, you'll need to align small cells along this boundary and that can get kind of tricky. Um, but you can see here the impact of these regions on the flooding. So here flow is obstructed and diverted around the pier area, which is really cool to watch. Uh, now RAS Mapper, all right, we've mapped it. It gave me a pretty map. Does it really matter where it comes from? You, know, you have to be careful taking mapping directly out of HECRAS and assuming it's perfect. Um, I would recommend verifying your data. Um, there have previously been noted differences between what RAS is mapping and what the model reports that it's calculating. And so you still might want to extract your calculation points and follow a manual mapping procedure. Here's just a pretty, pretty graphic for you of flow coming in and out of these constrictions here uh, along the French Broad River. So now that we've kind of set the stage of how the different models work, let's talk about the case study. We were looking at Wilson Road. You can see in this uh, picture here that it runs along the right side of the French Broad River. And so we were looking at this. This is near Brevard, North Carolina, which is in the mountains. And NCDOT desired a 50-year level of service along the road, and they didn't want to see pressure flow at the Wilson Road Bridge for the 100-year event. Now, Wilson Road, the bridge, is on the north end of this picture. Um, which is actually downstream. The French Broad is flowing north right here for this segment. And so <clears throat> there are also three other bridges you can see here that, that had acceptable level of service in the area. And when we were looking at Wilson Road, I just want to point out that HNTB is another firm that provided the transportation design for this project. Uh, and we helped them by looking at the hydraulics around all these structures. Now this is just kind of an overview, so you can see what the area looks like. This is a kind of a weird oblique picture, but I want to show you the river runs through this valley and it is, has fields on either side in the overbanks. So you can kind of see how flat this is, and, and that makes this a perfect case for 2D modeling. I'll show you here another picture where you can sort of see how the flooding occurs along the French Broad River here and how it really spreads out, um, how wide the floodplain is. And then this is the effect of SFHA. You can see, and Wilson Road is in the right over bank here. It's flowing north, um, is downstream. So uh, it's getting overtopped in a couple of areas and getting overtopped near where the existing bridge is as well. So, data input comparison. You know, when we were setting up these models, 
everything was pretty much the same between the two programs. So why is there a difference in the number of cells that were used? And that's a good question. You can see here, SRH2D, 130,000 elements, and HECRAS2D only had 23,000. So why do we do that? Well, when you're working in SRH2D and you're setting up patching, detailed patching, you can end up with a lot of extra cells. Um, and also when you're setting up the pressure flow boundary conditions and patching near a bridge, that requires more cells as well. Um, whereas HECRAS just has a pretty automated uh, mesh generation tool. And so <clears throat> one of the things I wanted to show as we're talking about data input is the proposed terrain image near Wilson Road. So you can see the underlying aerial imagery and where the existing bridge is. And then this red dashed line represents the new bridge. It's the new bridge that's going to span most of the floodplain um, with obviously with piers in there. And uh, also shows the embankments that will be created for this new bridge. So just to kind of give a reference of what's happening in this project, what we're looking at. Now structures. So we've discussed that SRH2D uses pressure flow boundaries in SMS to model bridges and pressure flow. And HECRAS doesn't have that option. Um, so that's one big difference in how the two models handled structures throughout our um, throughout this project. Uh, for peers, I do want to say that Aquaveo, they they don't really distinguish between either peer method that they have. So one peer method is you can use holes that um, just take a hole, you create a hole in the mesh. And this provides an obstruction to flow because it can't flow through the hole, so it has to go around it. Um, the other option is to use an obstruction. And <clears throat> these obstructions, um, while they will reflect a peer, they actually don't change the particle velocity tracing. So we ended up using a hole for our SRH2D model so that we could get that visualization. And um, for HECRAS, you don't even have the option to directly input peers because HECRAS isn't set up to model bridges currently. So you need to manipulate something. You can modify your terrain or you can increase your end values. And we decided to increase end values. And one of the reasons is because when you modify terrain, it doesn't seem to have the level of preci precision that an end value override polygon would, would represent because of the way that it in interpolates the terrain within that area of the pier. Now, Looking at SRH2D, we saw that uh, Highway 276, which is the most upstream bridge, was actually in pressure flow. And so this wasn't the focus of the study because Wilson Road is already pretty much tied in here and, is, and, and we would have been done with our analysis, but it is right up at that limit. And so this gave us a great opportunity to compare water surface elevations around a bridge um, that's in pressure flow with what HECRAS would calculate there. And so the graph on the left here comes from the, the water surface elevation profile that's taken along the center of the channel. And you can see that the velocity is increasing um, significantly within the structure. And if you remember the schematic from the beginning of the presentation, uh, this profile, it even seems to kind of draw down the water surface elevation within that bridge. You can see where the bridge face is in this, in this plot. And there's really a dip down within the structure and then before it comes back up on the downstream side. So there's kind of that low energy area right there where flow is being diverted down below that and pulling back up. And here's the RAS results along the same profile. So looking at the differences in water surface elevation and also the velocity differences, it's pretty clear that RAS misses the pressure component, which we knew because it's not modeling that. But it's also clear this is not an insignificant um, difference because it's almost a foot. Now here's a clip from the RAS model at um, Highway 276. And you may be able to tell from this, if you're looking at it, we didn't model peers here. And so our comparison is imperfect for sure. But this wasn't the focus of the project. Um, this is just a, a great opportunity. We had to do a comparison of the pressure flow component. Um, and was, so Wilson Road actually to the south intersects Highway 276. You can see it in the bottom right portion of this graphic. and um, and so that's kind of where our project ended. But you can see that there's still constrictions. You still have some dynamic um, calculations going on here that are impacting the upstream water surface elevation. And so now to our comparison of the Wilson Road Bridge. Our SA SRH2D results showed that the Wilson Road Bridge uh, was not in pressure flow. So we expected that our results would probably end up being similar. And so here you can see the mesh difference between the two models. And I just want to reiterate that we used holes um, shown in this, this left picture over here. We used holes to reflect the peers within SRH2D. And in HECRAS, we used n-value 
um, override polygon areas. So you can just think of these, these pretty pictures here. They're just artwork. Um, we could talk about the velocity vectors to the right, but the main focus uh, on this page, I want you to look at the plot. Here, this water surface elevation profile plot, uh, which it, you can sort of see the faint red line in this picture off to the right, uh, but this shows that elevations are gradually descending along the French Broad River, and there really wasn't a significant water surface elevation increase from the, from the impacts of the bridge structure here, which is mostly just the piers. And then this shows uh, how the water kind of flows near this bridge. This is a particle tracing plot from um, showing the velocities from SRHGD. Now, similarly, uh, we have two more pieces of artwork here you can look at. And the plot along the channel center line for uh, Hecaraz also shows a gradual decrease in elevation with no real significant increase due to constrictions. And this, this is just showing the flows going around the pier and the velocity within the, the end value override area is basically zero. And so as expected, and as we as shown in the profile plots, uh, water surface elevations near this Wilson Road bridge are similar between the two models since there's no pressure flow scenario here. So very similar elevations. Um, the other bridges in the model also, which weren't in pressure flow, they also perform similarly between the two models. Uh, but the bridge in the bridge in pressure flow that we talked about, Highway 276, there was almost a foot difference uh, between the calculated elevations. So I want to say, depending on your flow conditions and depending on the application of the model that you're developing, um, I, you know, I believe HECRAS may be used as a 2D bridge modeling solution, uh, but would obviously recommend verifying your answer with a model like SRH2D. <clears throat> so. HECRAS is a little more user friendly, and this is my opinion. Um, it also simplifies some of the output data, but there's, um, and I think one of the things to discuss when you're talking about the benefits of HECRAS over SRH2D, I think there's, there's pros and cons in SRH2D to being able to manipulate the terrain data. Um, this is like the pro, the positive would be, when I was doing this model, I needed to fix the elevations along Wilson Road in a particular area where they weren't applied correctly. And so I was able to do that easily in SRH2D and HECRAS would have taken a couple steps to make sure it's right and make sure it's generating the mesh correctly. Um, but the negative aspect of that is, is, is really just, it could make it more difficult to review these models um, to make sure that the terrain is staying consistent. There wasn't some manipulation within the model um, to, to force the results. So from a, from a review standpoint, if you're looking at a mapping product, um, or a LOMAR or something like that, it, it could make the, the review process a little more difficult. And this here is just showing the terrain. So the goal obviously was not to determine which model to use, but I do think it's appropriate to close the presentation with this discussion. Uh, if you have pressure flow, um, then you need to use SRH2D. Um, if anything, you should at least just verify in your RAS model, especially if there's a, a if you're looking at one structure that's not in pressure flow, but there's one nearby that is, you might want to, you need to verify before you just assume the RAS is going to give you the right answer. Um, and, and you might even want to just use SRH2D on its own because it's, it's approved by FEMA, just like HECRAS. Uh, but I think if you're, using a, if you're doing a large scale model, you're going to definitely get more efficiency out of HECRAS. Um, so I, I would say, hey, continue using HECRAS, but if you approach a bridge, understand its limitations, and I hope this presentation has helped with that. So I just want to thank you all for listening. Um, I know that at this point, I'm going to be tired of listening to my voice. So I look forward to being able to, to answer any questions you all might have and really just receive input and hear any ideas you've got. So thank you. Thanks, Matthew. That was really good. Um, we've got some good conversation going on uh, in the chat. I'm just going to give uh, go through them quickly and give you an opportunity to to add your two cents to what's going on. Uh, can you uh, add uh, some discussion to the uh, uh, opportunity to use SMS uh, as a free version? Uh, yeah, I think that was a great, uh, great comment that I, I left out there is there is a free version out there. Um, obviously with 
any software, when you can purchase it, you're going to get more functionality. And it's really not that expensive to purchase it. Uh, but it, it could be a, a big cost depending on your project and what your budget is. So uh, we ended up purchasing the, the paid version here. So that's what we use. Um, but yes, there's a free version out there. Is there, uh, what, what types of benefits do you get from the paid version? Do you know? Um, the limits are, you know, just really, you can do a lot with a free version, but the paid version gives you the opportunity, I think, to do more of like sensitivity analyses and look at, um, look at, uh, more mesh opportunities. Uh, I think the ability to use, um, I think the ability to model peers with a whole is probably might not be available in the free version, but I could be wrong, um, which is something that was discussed in the presentation. So. Oh, okay. Um, a comment from Anonymous. Uh, it appears that your SRH 2D mesh has five times the number of HECRAS 2D elements uh, and that that was suggested as the main reason for the time difference? Yeah, I think that was discussed in the presentation. I mean, it's definitely not a main point of the presentation is to, to talk about the, the speed of the software, but it is a it does seem that with similar number of elements, HECRAS is going to run faster. And then clearly here, yeah, we had more elements, so it ran a lot faster. But um, I don't know. Hopefully that was addressed. Okay. It looks like there's a follow-up comment uh, along those lines. Uh, Jeff uh, asked, have you considered using Ray's terrain for peers in RAS 2D as long as falls along cell face? Uh, also using a raised embankment via 2D connection. Yeah, Jeff, this is a great question. Um, we we did we looked at it with, with uh, terrain. I'm not sure if I had any examples in there, but one of the things we noticed when you try to use your, your cells in your DEM that's supporting the terrain in RAS is you get some interpolation along that. And so if you cut a profile along your terrain, when you want your pier to be straight up and down, you can kind of get this trapezoidal shape. Um, so, so we didn't use that just, just out of comfort and not enjoying, not, not liking that part of it. Now the raised embankment with a 2D connection, I guess you're talking about drawing like an SA to 2D connection line around the pier and trying to make a weir out of it. I think the issue we had is that you, you can't close the loop on that in HECRAS 2D. So we would get a little bit of flow in there. And ultimately the, the water surface elevation wasn't that different. Um, no matter what we did, it's just kind of a small increase because this structure at Wilson Road wasn't in pressure flow. So we just used in values polygons as just a simple approach and it seemed to work just as well as the other stuff. So, but those are all really great ways to try and uh, model that as well. Yeah. Uh, and Mark pointed out that RAS also utilizes the subgrade uh, subgrid terrain detail, so less cells are needed to represent the terrain. Yep. Yeah, you get more. There's more detail in, in RAS. I think I mentioned that in one point. Like SRH2D works like other 2D models do. You kind of have the center point, and it's the average elevation terrain. That's where all the computations are. And RAS along the faces um, has has a profile and and has a whole bunch of different. Um, you know, it looks at the terrain underneath each cell and creates tables of volume and all this different stuff at, at different elevations. So uh, it definitely um, incorporates all of that. That's a good comment. Um, and right now, I just, uh, just suggested that uh, looking at the models to compare them fairly, they uh, use similar size uh, or same number of cells. Yeah, that would, yeah, that would be good. If you, if you really were focused on runtime and wanted to compare that, then yeah using models the same cells would be good. Uh, did, you, uh, did you use the features in SMS SRH2D to merge triangles and significantly reduce the number of elements? We, um, we did work on that. The one of the big, the big causes, which I think was touched on in the presentation for the number of elements is really trying to model the bridges and trying to get, um, trying to, do a good job at those pressure flow boundaries. So you have to add a lot of cells in there. And that really bumped up the cell count, trying to get that that type of um, precision, so. Okay. Hey, Jennifer asked, uh, HECRAS has, uh, 1D has pressure. Uh, is it just not available as a 2D? Yeah, it's currently not available as 2D that I know of, unless something got released very recently that I missed. <laughs> but they're, I think they're working on it from everything I've heard. I'm sure Mark Forrest can fill you in more on the timeline of that, but yeah. Uh, 
Reinaldo, I guess he's just adding a comment to part of the discussion here. Subgrid terrain cells in HECRAS ignore momentum within the cell, which is not equivalent to refining the mesh resolution. Okay. Uh, it seems to be some discussion going on about that comment. So maybe that's something that can be uh, cleared up offline. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> And um, that, that looks like about it. So um, thank you so much. Uh, the next uh, presentation is Rachel Pickleman. She's with SEH and she's gonna be discussing 2D in the water resources mainstream, eye-opening case studies and simplicity of simplicity and value. Hello. Thanks for tuning into this presentation. My name is Rachel Pickleman, and I'm a senior water resource engineer at SCH. And during this presentation, I'm going, going to be sharing several case studies of um, projects where we've used a two-dimensional model, and it has provided many benefits. So the case study locations are listed here, but before I jump into those, I'm going to give a little bit of background information on the difference between 1D and 2D hydraulic modeling as it relates to riverine systems and urban systems. So the inherent assumption with a one-dimensional model is that the conveyance and velocity and those physical forces associated with it are really only significant in one dimension. And I'm showing here the effective floodplain mapping for Heart Ditch in Munster, Indiana. Heart Ditch is shown here on the, with the blue. And the effective FEMA mapping is showing that for the 100 year, it's estimated that the entire floodplain is going to be within the channel. So it's pretty safe to assume that the flow here is essentially one dimensional. And if you were to create a one dimensional model of um, heart ditch, you'd be cutting cross sections that are perpendicular to flow to define the, the channel and the overbank areas. Now let's switch gears to a stream that's probably not so one dimensional. This is Beaver Creek in southeastern South Dakota. So just by looking at the aerial view, you can see that the stream is meandering, takes a lot of turns. And um, you can even kind of see some remnants of old channels out here. From this, you have a pretty good understanding that it's probably a complex flow pattern that's occurring, not only in the channel, but also in the overbank areas during a significant flood. A lot of times, even when we know a stream is complex like this, we still need to create a 1D model to conform to the regulation. So if we create a 1D model of Beaver Creek, we um, need to identify the stream center line here in blue, and then we need to cut cross sections that we believe are perpendicular to flow in the channel and in the overbank areas. But it's really hard to say for sure if our cross sections are truly perpendicular to the flow. So we need to be careful about choosing our cross section locations and orientation, and then Another thing we probably believe is that there's going to be areas within the floodplain that really aren't effectively conveying water downstream. They're more just storing water. So in a 1D model, we represent that by defining ineffective flow areas. But those are based on our assumption of the boundary between effective and ineffective flow. And another thing we do in a 1D model to try to represent a more complex flow condition is we'll increase our expansion and contraction coefficients where we believe flow is going to be expanding or contracting to increase the losses in those areas. But all of these things that we're doing to create our one-dimensional model are based on our assumptions and our definitions. So we may be inadvertently limiting the results or generating inaccurate results. The results that we get from a 1D model can be tabular like this, where we can see at a particular cross-section location, 
what the estimated water surface elevations are for different flow rates. We can also view the results at each cross section that we've defined within the model. So at each cross section, we're going to see a single water surface elevation for each flow rate that was analyzed. And then in a profile view, we can see the, what the stream profile might look like for different flow rates. But this is based on the water surface elevation that's computed at each cross section that we defined. So that water surface elevation is computed at these points, but the profile is based on just a straight line between those two points. And in reality, that might not be the case. But that's the best we can get from a 1D hydraulic model. Now let's talk about a 2D model for that same stream. To create a 2D model, we want to make sure that we incorporate the entire floodplain. And to do that, we need a topographic surface. Oftentimes, we'll use survey data, detailed survey data, like in the vicinity of the bridge or culvert that we're replacing. But we usually need to supplement that with LIDAR data, like we did here. That topographic data is really going to serve as the foundation of the 2D model. And on top of it, we drape a two-dimensional mesh. And what we're showing here is these tiny little triangular elements that comprise the mesh. And with a 2D calculation, the water is balanced between these adjacent cells. So the flow isn't just confined to one dimension. With the 2D model, we get results like this one that shows an inundation map of the stream. So in this simulation or this video, it's filling up the floodplain with 100-year flow rate. But we can see the red is showing greater depth, blue shallower. We see those old historic channels that have been cut off over time. But this um, inundation map is really helpful because right away we can see, well, this home is um, quite a bit, you know, a, a clear distance from the floodplain. And this one's pretty close. We didn't need to look at a tabular result of cross-section data and correlate it to a real-world location. We got that result right away from this model. And then we can also see a two-dimensional, um, a different two-dimensional result, which is a particle flow trace video. So I'll play that here. And this really shows us what the flow patterns are throughout the floodplain. This can be really helpful to help us um, identify the proper cross-section locations in a 1D model and make sure that they are drawn perpendicular to flow throughout the floodplain. A particle flow trace result can also be really helpful in identifying areas like this and this that really aren't actively conveying the flow downstream. So the first case study I'm going to share is still in southeastern South Dakota. And I'm going to really just present a few different results that we got from the SRH2D model of this stream. Here we have a 3D view with the terrain and the aerial photograph. And then it's actually a plot of the velocity. So what we see here is that the velocity is computed at each of those triangular cells that are um, making up that mesh. So across the floodplain, we see a lot of variation in the velocity. That can help us choose appropriate riprap size and extent, too. And then another type of inundation map, rather than showing depth, this one is showing the water surface elevation. And as I mentioned, the results are produced at each of those elements that are in our 2D mesh. It's not just produced at a cross section that we drew across the subplane. So, I want to point out that if we were to produce a 1D model of this stream, we would likely have a cross section in this vicinity. It's parallel to the roadway and is essentially perpendicular to the flow. And if we had a cross section drawn right here from a 1D model, our results would provide just one water surface elevation for that entire cross section. But when we look at these tables, we see that the difference in water surface elevation between those points three and four is pretty significant. So with a 2D model, we have that spatial variation in velocity and also in elevation. And then another particle flow trace, this one is just really helpful 
to see um, those areas where the real water is not being actively conveyed downstream. So we would use this result to define our ineffective flow boundary and to help us figure out how far downstream we should be increasing those expansion and contraction coefficients. This is a quote from our client there, Shannon Schultz. He said that the 2D models really helped put many local rumors to rest. And it gave all of us more confidence in the no-rise finding. But it um, also kept everyone better informed on the riprap sizing, too. So the second case study I'll share is in Duluth, Minnesota. Duluth is in northeastern Minnesota along Lake Superior. And in June of 2012, they experienced an unprecedented flooding event with more than eight inches falling pretty much right on the city um, over less than a two-day period. These are some of the photos that were taken. But the peak of the flooding actually occurred in the middle of the night. So um, kind of that worst case condition wasn't actually captured with a lot of photography. What we were hired to do in Duluth was study Coffee Creek and help the city prepare a letter of map revision because they observed that in the June 2012 event, flow coming down Coffee Creek towards Central Entrance actually split at Central Entrance due to the limited culvert capacity. And a lot of flow was routed down the hill along Central Entrance into the adjacent watershed. And this is the sketch that the city provided of that routing. So they said the breakout flow went down Central Entrance, left the road, filled up a low area, crossed the road to the south side, flowed down Palm Street, split, and so on. And it was um, a pretty complex flow pattern that was observed. So the goal with the letter of map revision was to update the modeling to incorporate that diversion, which was essentially removing flow from the Coffee Creek watershed. And then they also recognized that they needed to update some of the um, storm sewer and culvert data for Coffee Creek. This is what the effective floodplain maps looked like. Um, and so they show a floodplain boundary that is simply within the Coffee Creek watershed, suggesting that the water in Coffee Creek is expected to stay in Coffee Creek for a 100-year event. This is the firm, and then this is the floodway, the, the flood boundary and floodway map, but essentially showing the same thing. So during a 100-year event, it was estimated that about half of the peak flow coming down Coffee Creek would actually be diverted down central entrance into the adjacent watershed. So that's about half of the water that's leaving the Coffee Creek watershed. And we talked to the DNR about preparing a letter of map revision to more accurately show that flow split and the reduction within Coffee Creek. And the response was that if we were to proceed with a letter of map revision, we would need to map that breakout flow path, that overland flow path, as regulatory floodway. So here's another look at that um, breakout flow path. That would mean mapping central entrance uh, roadway, which is a state roadway, businesses, residences, city streets, and so on as regulatory floodway. That was not um, a very popular idea. The DOT was involved in this project as well, and they recognized that there's, you know, some pretty unique flow patterns going on that would be best represented with a two-dimensional model. So they actually created an SRH2D model of Coffee Creek to analyze the existing conditions. And this is what the inundation mapping showed from Coffee Creek. So there's breakout that's occurring right here at the culvert, and then it's flowing down central entrance, filling up this little area, crossing the street, flowing down Palm Street, pretty close match to this, pretty much right on. And with this model, it was one of the first SRH2D models that the DOT had prepared. So seeing the visual results like that, that so closely matched the observed conditions, really built confidence in all of us. So then the DOT said, well, we'll hand off the SRH2D model to you, and um, you can use it to size, you know, culverts. So we actually, or to analyze the, uh, pro some proposed conditions. We actually used just HY8 to size the culverts. So we did it such that 
the headwater elevation for the culvert would be lower than the road overtopping elevation. And we took the SRH2D model and plugged in that larger culvert size and ran it again. We were fully expecting it to show no breakout flow. But what we see here is a secondary breakout flow path that allows water to get into this north-south street and be conveyed into central entrance. And certainly the water that's splitting here and flowing down central entrance is less than the existing condition, but it was really surprising for us to see that any breakout flow was still occurring. But the 2D model showed us that it wasn't all about the headwater elevation at this point. There was this secondary path that allowed water to get out of Coffee Creek and um, flow down the roadway. So we used SRH2D to properly size the culvert, and we had it again just to be sure that we were gonna be able to convey all of the 100-year flow for Coffee Creek downstream and keep it within the Coffee Creek watershed. But if we had relied just on the 1D modeling to make a recommendation for that culvert size, it would, would have underestimated the size that was needed. Switching gears to urban um, hydraulic modeling. And when I say urban modeling, what I mean here is storm sewer systems that are um, insufficient and are leading to a flood condition. So if we create a 1D urban stormwater model, we would um, have the pipe network, which I have shown here, and it's reasonable to analyze a pipe network in one dimensional analysis because the water is confined to the pipe. But what happens when the pipe is undersized and we know there's surface ponding or water that might be routed along the surface? It gets pretty difficult to develop a 1D model when we know there's complex surface patterns going on. But if with a 1D model, one of the nice results that we get is a pipe profile like this that shows the hydraulic grade line along the system. And when we see the hydraulic grade line is diverging from the pipe slope like this, it suggests that the pipe's undersized. This result is helpful to identify like the, the cause of the problem. But we get that kind of result and more when we create a two-dimensional urban model. With a 2D urban model, once again, we have that topographic surface, and we're going to keep the 1D storm sewer model in there, but to that, we're going to add a layer um, on the surface that's going to analyze flow in two dimensions. So to do that, we add a grid, and taking a closer look at that, this is a grid that um, has just, you know, hundreds or thousands of square elements, and each one of those cells it's gonna take on an elevation based on that underlying topographic surface. And then the water can be routed between adjacent cells. It's not confined to flow in just one dimension. And this is the kind of result that we can get from a 1D, 2D stormwater model. We see the flow split wrapping around this house through the street into the pond, and that was a very close match to what was um, described to us by the client. So our first urban case study is in Olivia, Minnesota, and they received a significant rainfall event in August 2016. When my coworker was starting to work on this project, she asked me to help with scoping the, scoping the analysis. And she showed me a storm sewer map like this. And she said, when they got that rainfall event, it flooded here and here and here and here and here. <laughs> and she was explaining to me that in this flooding area, there's actually two separate storm sewer systems that pass through it. So these storm sewer systems are sharing a surface storage area. And that alone would be a challenging thing to model in a 1D only model. And I told her that I think we needed to analyze this with a 1D, 2D analysis. And her initial reaction was that no, we did not have the budget to do a 2D model. That sounded really expensive. And I said, I don't think that we have the budget to do just a 1D model because it's going to be a lot of work to take complex flow patterns and dumb them down to fit into just a 1D model. So some of the flooding that um, occurred in August 2016 is shown in these photos here. Again, this is believed to be from insufficient storm sewer size. 
So we created that 1D, 2D, X, G, swim model and generated results that look like this. So this is our calibration event, that August 2016 event. And I shared this result with the city administrator and right away he said, yes, that's what it looked like. <laughs> so it was really easy for him to review our results and provide feedback. And if we take a closer look at one of those areas, if you're standing here and you're looking straight north, you'd see a lot of water in the street. And that's exactly where this photo was taken, standing here looking straight north. Standing in that same position but looking to the northwest, you'd see water kind of wrapping around the south side of these homes and filling the screen space. And that's exactly what was observed and documented in this photo. So we used our 1D, 2D model to develop and analyze several different scenarios. At the beginning of the project, we promised to provide three different proposed conditions. But the 1D, 2D modeling allowed us to be so efficient and saved us time that we were able to um, analyze six alternatives instead of just three. And for each alternative that we looked at, we produced these side-by-side -side inundation maps to illustrate how the flooding would be expected to be reduced for each condition, for each um, proposed scenario. And when I shared this result with the city council, there was almost like this sigh of relief from them. They were so happy to be presented information in a way that was easy to understand. And they were so happy not to be handed tables of um, elevations and manhole IDs that were really hard to associate with a place in the real world. So the city administrator said that the 2D modeling greatly helped make complex hydraulic data understandable for our city council and city staff, which in turn allowed them to make informed decisions about future city planning needs. And I think that's just it. We're seeing in so many cases that these 2D results allow non-technical folks to be really engaged in the conversation and the decision-making process. The last case study I'm going to share is in Lowell, Indiana. And once again, I was handed a map that showed a bunch of areas that were flooded. So I suggested that we create a 1D, 2D XP swim model, where again, the pipe network is analyzed with one dimensional calculations, but we represent the surface flooding and flow routing with 2D analysis. So just some photos real quick that were provided of the different um, ponding areas. You can see that in this particular location, the water was like mid calf on this woman, so maybe 18 inches or knee deep, two feet, something like that. The preserve subdivision was constructed in phases, and I'm highlighting those here. The city or the town of Lowell wanted us to do this analysis at this time because they were getting ready to review the plat for the next phase of the addition. And knowing that there were storm sewer drainage issues in the current developed area, they felt that it was a good time to potentially address those issues too. So we used the August 2016 event to calibrate our model, and these are the results that we produced. So in this area on Marion Drive, the depth was one and a half to two feet or so. And that's about the same area where that woman was standing with water up to about her knees. So generally speaking, pretty good match to what was observed. We used our 1D, 2D model to analyze different scenarios like rerouting flows as requested by the town. And this side-by-side -side comparison showed that while the flooding at this intersection was reduced with that flow redirection, it actually introduced the problem in that area. When I was working on this project, I was looking at the historical aerials and I noticed that I could kind of distinguish a flow um, plath or a drainage way through the um, development. And this was in the 1978 aerial before any development occurred. And then fast forward 20 years to 1998, that drainage path is partially interrupted by the partial construction of the development. 2005, the drainage path is essentially gone um, and the development is essentially built. And in 2018, the development is complete and the drainage path is completely gone. 
So let's rewind a little bit and look at our um, inundation maps again from that August 2016 event. And let's just bring those same drainage path lines on the map. And what do you know? There's a perfect match to the areas that are most flood prone being on top of the prior drainage path, that natural drainage way that occurred prior to any of the development. So I said, all right, with this next phase of development that is expected to be built, let's just put all the modeling aside and just look at the topography. So we identified the primary drainage paths today. And I told the um, town manager that you really needed to pay close attention to these drainage paths when you receive the development plans. Make sure that the stormwater is going to be properly managed and routed downstream so as not to be weaving between homes. And this information was really helpful for them and the timing of it was perfect. Um, and they were able to provide feedback to the developer and make sure that dedicated drainage easements were provided along these paths. So that correlation between the frequently flooded areas in the development and the historical drainage path being in the same area sparked an ongoing conversation about better stormwater planning, which would include dedicated drainage easements intended to minimize flood risk to structures. And the 2D model made complex concepts easy to understand. So I've got a list here of different benefits of two-dimensional models. And I can tell you that this list just keeps growing with every model that we create. So really quickly, the Federal Highway has a change program, and that is the Collaborative Hydraulic Advancing to the Next Generation of Engineering. And that's part of the Federal Highway Administration's Everyday Counts program. Some of the main initiatives are listed here, improved quality and resiliency, enhanced collaboration, and streamlined delivery. And I can tell you firsthand that using two-dimensional models for hydraulic analysis of complex flow patterns fully supports all of these initiatives of the Federal Highways Change Program. And with that, I will conclude my presentation. that might be intercepted by the storm sewer and you already have a good understanding of the storm sewer's capacity and its um, function, then yes, that you could do that. But generally speaking, if you're analyzing a large storm sewer network, um, it would be best to use XP Swim, something, something else that is gonna do a full analysis of um, the storm sewer system and the flooding being just, you know, a function of insufficient pipe size or in the capacity or that kind of thing. So SRH2D is definitely geared toward analysis of um, roadway embankments at bridges and culverts, uh, generally open channel applications, but XP Swim is more geared toward um, the storm sewer analysis with surface flooding. Okay. Uh, next question, uh, the Coffee Creek pre project, the upsized culvert will be sending more flow downstream. Is that what they were understanding? Right. Yep. It would keep more flow within the Coffee Creek watershed. Um, and so we actually sort of paused um, our work on that, did not prepare the formal MT2 documentation or apply for a letter of map revision because the city really wanted to step back and reassess, okay, what will this mean for the downstream watershed? And um, we did talk to the city a bit about um, actually more of like an open channel restoration. Um, so I, show, I shared a graphic that showed that there's quite a long culvert stretch in there. Um, and so that could be replaced with open channel, something that might provide more storage as well. So um, that's definitely a consideration. And as of right now, nothing has physically changed. The culvert crossing central entrance has not been replaced. So there is not 
a flow change um, that has occurred yet. Okay, and and it looks like a follow up to that from Matt. Uh, did FEMA DOT require any additional modeling to confirm this increased flow would not change the floodplain boundaries? Right. So if we were to proceed with a letter of map revision, we would of course then need the inundation mapping to be based on all of the flow staying within the Coffee Creek watershed. Yes, that would be part of that next step. Okay. Uh, looks like a comment from Scott. Uh, SRH2D has internal boundary conditions that can be used to remove flow at, at inlet controlled storm inlets to represent flow diversion to a storm drain system. Yeah, so that's an answer to that first question. Okay. Yep. Um, 2D tools, uh, I haven't even read this one yet, so bear with me. Uh, 2D tools will become the norm because these limitations in 1D models may not identify these flow bifurcations or connections. Yeah, I can agree with that. Um, you know, in general, we've been developing two dimensional models on projects, even if it's not in the scope, because if we take that additional step to create a two dimensional model or add a 2D layer to a 1D um, XC swim model, we have so much more confidence in the results. And that gives us more confidence in our recommendations for minimizing flooding, too. So um, I hope that it really is, you know, the go to. Um, but there's some hurdles um, that need to be crossed in terms of regulations for riverine studies. So with uh, defining a floodway is very challenging in a two-dimensional model. Um, and so, you know, conducting a no-rise analysis also has some challenges. And I actually took that information out of the presentation, um, but there's a white paper that FEMA published. Um, and I think the most recent version was released last summer, but it really lays out the differences between 1D and 2D models and the challenges with using a 2D model within the current regulatory framework. Okay. Um, it looks like we're also having some audio problems, so I apologize for that. Uh, one last question uh, is, uh, have you used InfoWorks ICM? Any thoughts on the differences between XP Swim and InfoWorks? I personally have not. Um, we've been given kind of a sales pitch on um, taking that step to, to use it, but we have not taken that step yet. So we're we definitely prefer to use XP Swim um, right now. Okay. Um, all right. Well, that was great. Thank you so much. Uh, moving along to the next presentation, we've got Kyle Miller. Uh, he's with Meshek and Associates, uh, and he's going to be discussing an inundated highway parallel to the floodplain modeling to protect bridge infrastructure. Rachel, I uh, just copied and pasted the comments in. Okay. 
are, 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 are due north of Tulsa, and the drive from Tulsa to the project site is roughly 40 minutes. Let's start to take a look at some of the project details. This is a slide of the Bird Creek Bee Firm floodplains. We can see the project site circled here in the center. One thing we can note straight off the bat is that Bird Creek has substantially wide floodplains and floodways. And to touch back on the, the title of this presentation, the highway is parallel to the floodplain. We can see that State Highway 11 that runs due north and south here is running parallel to the uh, general overbank flow of the Bird Creek floodplain. Now, as many of you who have modeled enough know that this is not going to be as simple or straightforward as a regular perpendicular crossing, it's particularly in a 1D model. The goal of this project is to determine the effects of replacing this bridge. I'll touch more on the, the specifics of this in a minute. I do want to go ahead and just state from the beginning that we did end up choosing a 2D model for this hydraulic study, and I will kind of show you why we did, why we did that over the course of this presentation. Uh, another thing we thought of while doing this presentation is we had an idea that this new bridge replacing the existing bridge probably won't change the stream BFE all that much. Uh, the only reason that it might have a significant change is if we tried to add a lot more uh, well, uh, volume to the embankment, which reduced the floodplain storage, or if we tried to restrict the conveyant area. Here's a quick project overview. As I mentioned, the, the project site itself is roughly two miles north of State Highway 20. There's a, a, a few bits of information there on the left I'll let you read through. Uh, most importantly, this bridge is a perch bridge. Uh, the surrounding area is rather flat, and the approaches and embankments that, that lead up to the bridge are, are built up, and the bridge superstructure itself is built up in order to sit above any of the floodwaters to prevent press, pressurization and damage. So why, do we, why does ODOT want to replace this bridge? Well, at one of the last inspections, uh, they found that the bridge is nearing the end of its service life. And one of the other things for this two-lane highway is that ODOT would like to increase the safety uh, for this bridge by, by increasing the uh, shoulder width to 12 feet. So we had some flooding in May of 2019 last year. What we're looking at here on the, on the lower left image is the intersection of State Highway 20 and State Highway 11. If this boat here were to take a left at this intersection, it would reach our project site in approximately two miles. The other picture is uh, flipped around, looking back towards the town of Skytook so we can see the boundary of the floodplain. These two pictures are roughly of the same positions just uh, lifted up a bit higher in the air from a helicopter. Uh, what, what we can see here on the left is the same intersection, again just two miles south of the project site. And again the other picture is looking in the other direction back to the town of Skytook. So what I want to point out in these pictures is these bridges here on State Highway 20 also cross Bird Creek Channel. They are perch bridges as well and they sit up and out of the floodplain. This is what we imagine our bridges look like uh, on State Highway 11 right now during this flood. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get any photographs during this flood. Uh, it, it is just a sole bridge that sits out in the middle of some fields, and we had a lot uh, more important items to, uh, to attend to during this flood. So I wish we could have had some pictures, but we'll have to kind of do with this. But this, this really gives you a good idea of what our bridge is going to look like anyway. But you can see how the the, the bridge is designed to sit up above the channel, and the two overbanks are, are designed to overtop and flood the highway at either end. Uh, one of the things we can see here uh, is that with the two wide overbanks in the channel itself, fairly well split sometimes. You know, a lot of times you'll see some, some green space in between them. We can imagine how each of these, these pieces uh, may have varying topographies and how we may get different flows directions and velocities in each of these pieces. 
This flood is also roughly a, a design flood in terms of the water surface elevations and channel velocities that we want to account for on this project. The bridge will need, the new bridge will need to be perched up, up and out of these floodwaters uh, to be able to prevent any damage during the flood. And we will also need to uh, determine how much water is passing through the channel and through the bridge uh, to estimate the, the potential amount of scour we need for the foundations. This is the Bird Creek watershed, jumping into hydrology now. Uh, mainly located in Osage County of Oklahoma in the Northeast. We've got a total of 455 square miles of drainage area. There are four controlling reservoir structures in this watershed, uh, leaving us with an effective drainage area of, of roughly 340 square miles. So let's talk about some hydrology methods we could use on this project. Uh, we actually have a couple of USGS stream gauges on, on Bird Creek, and I'll, I'll get into that uh, on the next slide here. Uh, we could also use regression equations. Uh, regression equations could be used for a, a drainage basin and watershed such as the Bird Creek one. Uh, we could also use a combination of gauge analysis and regression equations. So because there is not a gauge on our project bridge, we could use regression to fill in the intervening area below uh, the upstream gauge. Uh, unit hydrograph is also another option for this project. However, we have determined this, this method to be uh, not, the, not the best method for this project, as it, 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 a unit hydrograph tends to take more time involvement to develop a model. And plus, ODOT generally suggests that we use regression or gauge analysis uh, to begin with. So let's take a bit more look at that gauge analysis. USGS has two, two stream gauges on Bird Creek, one at Avent and one at Sperry. Each have uh, several years of record, which do include the 2019 uh, peak floods. What we would normally use when we do a stream gauge analysis is use the USGS peak FQ software. We would use this uh, in combination with some of these references below the uh, scientific investigations report that USGS uh, built in coordination with ODOT for use of regression, and met regression method analysis in the state of Oklahoma. It also provides some specific gauge analysis data across the state. And then on top of that, we would, we would also use the Department of Interior and USGS bulletin number 17B at the time when we started this project, and then now C is the current update to that. So these are the uh, gauge analysis results. These are actually from the uh, US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, after the 2019 flood, the US Army Corps went back and reviewed a lot of the gauges and updated the probable design flows in, in many of the streams. So these are actually some of the flows that they came up with. And then there at the, at the bottom row, I, I put the May 2019 floods uh, up against the uh, probable design flows on, each, on, this, on the Bird Creek stream here. So you can see how, how big that flood was. And, it, and it, we came very close to approaching a 1% annual chance or 100 year flood. So let's move on to the, the results of the other hydrology methods. In the first two columns, you can see that I ran a couple of regression points. One was at the Avant gauge, and the other was at the project site at State Highway 11. Now, when you, if you look at columns one and three, you'd actually be able to directly compare the regression and stream gauge analysis. And you can see that um, there gets to be a bit of a divergence as we uh, move towards the lower probability floods. Uh, you can also look at the difference between the two stream gauges. There is, again, another uh, divergence as we move uh, to the lower probability floods. However, Sperry is further downstream so from Avant, so it is logical to believe that uh, uh, some flow was added in between. Uh, the last column shows uh, a, a gauge analysis and regression combination, where regression accounted for the intervening area downstream of the Avant gauge. Um, 
So one of the what our, what our final choice in hydrology method ended up being is we is we chose to go with the just the pure gauge analysis results, and we wanted to take that because those represent uh, physical historic flows on Bird Creek, and we feel like they're just going to be more accurate for the stream. So what we actually did for our our our, our modeling was we we used the Avant uh, stream gauge uh, analysis and use those. Uh, probable design flows. So let's move on into some uh, hydraulic requirements. One of the big things we're going to need to do, since this is a uh, FEMA Zone AE where the project site is located, we're going to need to compare existing and revised water surface elevations. Uh, being that it is in a Zone AE, we cannot have a, a rise in, in, in BFEs unless we do a plumber and lower, which ODOT would prefer not to do. So we are, we are shooting for a no rise scenario. Uh, the other thing we need to do that I mentioned before is we need to determine the amount of, of potential bridge uh, foundation scour that is possible. So we're going to have to figure out how to break the flow um, out of out of the stream that actually stays in the channel and travels through the bridge. Uh, you can kind of get an understanding of that with the uh, with the cross section there showed on the slide. We do have a choice of, of using a 1D or 2D model. Again, I mentioned we, we went ahead and picked the 2D model for this project because a 2D can account for those varying flow directions uh, in each of the overbanks and, and, and channel. But I do want to go through and point out the, the troubles with the 1D model, particularly the, the cross-section placement and difficulty that, that, uh, that, that comes with that. So here we have uh, two options we can roughly choose from. We've shown a few uh, flow, general flow path areas, arrows for you, so you can kind of get a sense of, of what's happening. Now the first picture on the left is really based on the DFIRM model. Uh, these cross sections are laid out perpendicular to the direction of flow. Uh, some of the bad things about that is that we end up having to have some uh, sharp uh, turns in the cross section in order to stay perpendicular to the channel when we get there, and then we, we turn back to, to cover the uh, right outer bank. And, and really having sharp corners in your cross section is not a good modeling technique. Uh, the other the other problem with this layout is that some of the cross sections these cross sections are not similar to a crossing uh, that is perpendicular to the floodplain. Normally, we would have cross sections that are uh, upstream of the upstream of the roadway, upstream of the bridge, and downstream of the road, roadway and downstream of the bridge. In this in this instance, we would have cross sections that are basically on the, the downstream side of the bridge, at some point they cross the channel, and then as they get to the right side of the cross section, they are on the upstream side of the roadway. This again leads to some conflicts between uh, the varying water surface and flow directions, again, that uh, I alluded to in, in the stream. <clears throat> what if we were to uh, on the other hand, what if we were to align the cross sections to be uh, parallel with the highway like we normally do? So it, it, there on the right picture, if we place a bunch of cross sections uh, straight down the highway, and we could have some uh, on the upstream and downstream side of the highway. The problem with this is that the cross sections are no longer oriented in the direction of flow. They're just merely oriented in the direction of the highway. And so this is also, again, not a good model because uh, on um, this instance on the left side, you may have a lot higher water surfaces on the left side of the cross section, where as several miles on the right side of the cross section, your water surfaces may be a lot lower. Uh, out of either of these layouts, the left one is actually probably the better option if you're going to do a 1D model. Uh, you know, the, these cross sections are more oriented perpendicular to the floodplain and, and would work well to model the floodplain itself. Uh, it just does not lend itself well to a detailed model of the bridge. Uh, again, we could argue that we're not exactly concerned with uh, 
the effects that the new bridge is going to cause because there is already a bridge in place there. And, and if we don't make drastic changes, then there probably is not going to be uh, any significant changes with the new bridge. So why should we have a fully incorporated model that details both the stream and the bridge? This is why we kind of chose the uh, 2D model uh, to do most of the work uh, in, the, in our hydraulic study. Uh, so being able, so one thing we, we could do with the 2D model is we could determine the water surface elevations around the bridge, uh, just like you could do with a 1D model. Uh, and also with the 2D model, uh, it, it worked well with this bridge because the bridge is perched and it is not pressurized. Uh, all we had to do was to add, make sure that uh, we, we added in some piers and, and abutments to account for those features that uh, do interact with the water. One of the other things I want you to notice here on the uh, velocity tracers is that uh, I, I have been alluding to before that in, in both the overbanks and channel, there are uh, various flow directions and velocities that, that carry throughout each of those pieces. This is what made the project very challenging, and this is why we had to do it the way we did it. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is, in order to set our upstream boundary hydrograph, we were able to take a historical peak hydrograph from the Avant gauge, modify that to match the peak flows of the probable design flow floods that we um, have actual values for and apply those to the, the, the 2D model. The other thing that we were able to do with the, the 2D model is we were able to uh, determine how much flow actually goes through the bridge. And we did that by setting uh, profile lines across the bridge, channel, and floodplains. And this allowed us to back into and determine flows and velocities that do travel through the bridge. Uh, and again, the next step after that is once we determine those flows, we could then create a uh, we could create and estimate a, a scour potential uh, at the bridge. So this is a quick table of the results showing uh, the flows that actually do stay in the channel and go through the bridge. Uh, we can see as the uh, probability of flood decreases. The flow actually doesn't change all that much. However, compared to the total flow of the stream, we can see that uh, that decreases as the probable flood decreases. So that means that uh, no matter what flood we have, uh, not as much uh, water, or I'm sorry, no matter what flood we have, as we get to a larger flood, more flow tends to get out into the overbank than necessarily wanting to stay in the channel and go through the bridge. So these are some of the final um, layouts of our proposed bridge. Uh, the changes to Highway 11 will be fairly local to the bridge. We'll mainly just include the approaches and embankments uh, in the bridge itself. In general, the alignment will not change compared to the existing bridge. We'll, we'll change the vertical profile slightly. Uh, we were able to keep a perch bridge layout uh, that, that keeps the, the beams and superstructure raised up out of the water. Uh, we were also able to achieve that, that no rise uh, scenario in BFEs when comparing the, the proposed bridge back to the existing bridge scenarios in our hydraulic model. And then we were also able to determine the, the total depth of scour of uh, 11 and a half feet for the 1% annual chance. Thank you. Great, thanks Kyle. Uh, with um, looking at the comments, there's one comment from Brad. Uh, did you add bridge piers in the terrain or use a high Manning's end value? We were able to add the bridge piers into the, into the terrain itself and just have that incorporated into the, the, the model. Okay. And then uh, I, I, I did want to touch, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to type them in right now. We'll, we'll, we'll try and catch them. But I did want to just uh, touch on where the project is right now, that uh, we, 
ODOT is still trying to finalize this project. And so we're, we're still uh, coming up with any final uh, touches with our uh, partnering consultants uh, that are doing these actual structural design. So uh, it's still possible for some changes here. Uh, I also wanted to note that uh, I've, I've gotten another question on doing this presentation at another conference about uh, possible use of other software like SRH, uh, SRD, SRD2H. Um, which uh, several years ago, this was a, uh, a fairly new uh, software, especially in Oklahoma, which is when this, um, when this project kicked off in 2017. So uh, it, it's something we're going to look forward to, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll probably have to have uh, some more projects come through, but it, it's been very helpful to see uh, other engineers uh, show some of their projects and and how they're stepping through these projects uh, with the with that software. Okay, that's a great. Uh, a couple more comments that are coming in here. So, uh, did the two D results prove a no rise situation? Uh, yes, it did. We were able to to show that we weren't going to cause an increase in the BFEs. Uh, and, and we were able to simply just replace the existing bridge. Okay, and the depth of the scour range? Uh, I believe there in the last slide, I think I, I, I put the, the final 100-year, uh, 1% flood. Uh, it was around 11 and a half total feet. Uh, that's not broken out into the uh, individual types of scour. Um, we would also have done a 500-year, but I cannot recall that off the top of my head. I would imagine that uh, maybe a few more feet. Okay. Uh, one last question here: Does the one D FEMA floodplain look the same as the uh, as the two D model? We did go back and compare those two, the the D firm to our our floodplain that we generated. There were some differences. Um, however, I, I it it wasn't easy to state that. We, there were some areas that we increased the floodplain and some areas where the floodplain decreased. So it, it wasn't, it was hard to say that, uh, you know, the 1D model was, was better over the 2D. Uh, I think uh, if you were, I, I think if you were to redo the, the floodplain study here uh, for FEMA, you, you, you might have to do a, a bit more. Okay, um, that's what we have for the, the comments there. I'd like to take a second and thank all of our presenters. I think everybody did a great job. Um, if uh, uh, just for uh, posterity, anybody who's registered for the conference, these presentations will be uh, available after afterwards. Um, so uh, let's see, we've got one more question coming in. Have you explored the NCHRP methods for scour depth determination in piers, abutments, and structures? Thank you. Uh, no, I have not. Um, I can write it down and take a look at it, but we, we basically use the uh, Federal Highway Administration um, guidelines for, for scour analysis. Okay. Whether we do that in a spreadsheet or whether we do that with a, a 1D HIPRES model, that's, that's generally what I see engineering firms doing. As, as we would expect, the comments to start falling in uh, here at the minute. We've got, a, we've got two more minutes, so we'll, we'll, we'll do what we can with the time available. Uh, how do you document the data obtained from the modeling, like the channel velocity, overland velocity, and water surface elevation? Uh, so... I believe what we did uh, is, is we took some of those profiles that we created uh, for each uh, scenario for existing in our, in our revised conditions, and we, we can show a direct comparison in, in that respect. Okay. Um, uh, it's a, I guess the next question uh, has to do with the no-rides analysis using the effective model. Right. Right. Uh, so 
we were, were able to determine that the new bridge was not going to cause a, a change to that 1% uh, annual chance uh, simply because we're more or less replacing the, the structure itself where the existing structure was. So it, it wasn't like we were making huge changes and um, we did not cause a change to that to those BFEs or the special flood hazard area. So that uh, a need for Clomer Lomer uh, wasn't going to be uh, necessary in, in this project. Okay. And with that, we're, we're out of time. I'd like to encourage everybody to, to uh, venture over to the virtual exhibit halls. Um, and we'll, that's uh, for 30 minute break. Um, uh, coffee will be served. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, the plenary session starts at uh, 11 o'clock uh, Central Time. So thank you so much for everybody's participation. Thank you for the presenters. And I uh, look forward to uh, next sessions. Thank you. <laughs>